So, good morning, brothers and sisters. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father's guidance as we open his word and that of his prophet so that we may learn more of what he would have us to understand at this time? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you have provided in the week that has now passed. We thank you for the blessing that you are providing today, a day of rest, where we may set aside our cares and come closer into relationship with you. Direct us today, Father. Help me, please, so that your character may be seen and not mine. May your will be done in that which we will be studying. May your guidance become clear. May we understand that which we need to know for this time in Earth's history. To this end, we thank you. To this end, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay. <clears throat> now, as I was explaining to Theodore, um, a good bit of what we're going to cover today was based upon a comment that he had made this last Sabbath. We're going to look at several points. We're going to go back into the scripture selections. So as we do this, there will be times I will be asking others to read. Here at the beginning, we're going to go into a couple of documents that deal directly with the third day and one that deals with another comment that is also linked with the third day. Now, from three selected, three spiritual gifts, excuse me, 261.2, we read, after the children of Israel left Rephidim, they came to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the Lord. <clears throat> and Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. <clears throat> and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Now, as Mrs. White has written, there is no doubt here in my mind that all of the children of Israel, all tribes, and at that time, including the troublesome people have entered into a covenant with God. The people here entered into a solemn covenant with God and accepted him as their ruler by which they became the peculiar subjects of his divine authority. And the Lord said unto Moses, lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. When the Hebrews had met with difficulties in the way, they were disposed to murmur against Moses and Aaron and accused them of leading the host of Israel from Egypt to destroy them. God would honor Moses before them 
that they might be led to confide in his instructions and know that he had put his spirit upon them. Do we have any questions at this point as to what we're, what we're seeing? Okay. The Lord then gave Moses express directions in regard to preparing the people for him to approach nigh to them that they might hear his law spoken, not by angels, but by himself. The Lord said unto Moses, go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of the people upon Mount Sinai. The people were required to refrain from worldly care and labor and to possess devotional thoughts. God required them also to wash their clothes. He is no less particular now than he was then. He is a God of order and requires his people now upon the earth to observe habits of strict cleanliness. And those who worship God with uncleanly garments and persons who do not come before him in an acceptable manner, he is not pleased with their lack of reverence for him, and he will not accept the service of filthy worshipers, for they insult their maker. The creator of the heavens and of the earth considered cleanliness of so much importance that he said, and let them wash their clothes. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount or touch the borders of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall surely be put to death. There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. <coughs> Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. This commandment was designed to impress the minds of this rebellious people with a profound veneration for God, the author and the authority of their laws. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that were in the camp trembled. The angelic host that attended the divine majesty summoned the people by a sound resembling that of a trumpet, which waxed louder and louder until the whole earth trembled. So <clears throat> we've covered this once before, but it bears repeating. This occurred before Exodus 20. The people were given the covenant prior to Exodus 20. But the covenant was then expanded upon so that they could understand it more clearly. Any thoughts? Uh, the only thing I think about is the washing of their garments reminds me of Revelation, a washing of the robes. Right. Okay. And Josiah took away all the abominations out of the countries that pertained, pertained to the children of Israel and made all that were present in Israel to serve, even to serve the Lord their God. And all his days they departed not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. <clears throat> now, in this portion of Second Chronicles, was Josiah seeking to keep the entire law of God? And if he was, was he being prepared and the people being prepared 
to enter into covenant with God. Well, that was the purpose of this reform. Okay. After this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, now was the king to prepare the temple? No. Well, I mean, he, I don't think he's personally doing it. I think it's just his, his direction. Okay. I don't know, but after so this, what, what happens here is that, I mean, this is going to be the battle where, where he, he's going to die. Right. But he, he had basically set up everything for this reform, but then he's going to disobey God. Right. After this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Nico, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by Euphrates, and Josiah went out against him. But he sent ambassadors to him, saying, What have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? <clears throat> I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. For God commanded me to make haste, forbear thee from meddling with God, that he destroyed thee not. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him, and hearkened not unto the words of Necho from the mouth of God, and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. What's interesting to me when I when I was reading this through, Nico is speaking directly to the one, to Josiah, who is seeking to follow God. Okay. And he's being clear. I have what have I to do with thee? I come not against thee. And we're going to see this phrase, come not against, very soon. Now, of course, this is God speaking through Nico. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And the archer shot at King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, have me away. For I am sore wounded. His servants therefore took him out of the chariot and put him in the second chariot, which they had. And they brought him to Jerusalem and he died and was buried in one of the sepulchers of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. <clears throat> because Josiah died in battle, who will charge God with denying his word that Josiah should go to his grave in peace. They did not give orders for Josiah to make war on the king of Egypt. When the Lord gave the king of Egypt orders that the time had come to serve him by warfare, and the ambassadors told Josiah not to make war on Nico, no doubt Josiah congratulated himself that no word from the Lord had come directly to him. To turn back with his army would have been humiliating. So he went on. And because of this, he was killed in battle. A battle that he should not have had anything to do with. The man who had been so greatly honored by the Lord did not honor the word of God. <clears throat> the Lord had spoken in his favor predicting good things for him, and Josiah became self-confident and failed to heed the warning. He went against the word of God, choosing to follow his own way, and God could not shield him from the consequences of his act. In our day, men choose to follow their own desires and their own will. Can we be surprised that there is so much spiritual blindness? Now, can an application be made 
of Josiah with the corporate church today? Uh-huh. Yeah. I know individually people are want to be uh, either pastors or whatever, and God didn't call them to do that. Right. Or teachers or whatever. God never called them. Right. See a lot of them. So there is quite an example here with Josiah as we are seeing it today. Now we go back to first spiritual gifts. The Bible was hated and efforts were made to rid the earth of the precious word of God. The Bible was forbidden to be read on pain of death. And all the copies of the holy book, which could be found, were burned. But I saw that God had a special care for his word. He protected it. At different periods, there were but a few copies of the Bible in existence. Yet God would not suffer his word to be lost. And in the last days, copies of the Bible were to be multiplied so that every family could possess it. I saw that there were but a few copies of the Bible. It was precious and comforting to the persecuted followers of Jesus. It was read in the most secret manner, and those who had this exalted privilege felt that they had had an interview with God, with his son Jesus, and with his disciples. But this blessed privilege cost many of them their lives. If discovered, they were taken from reading the sacred word to the chopping block, to the stake, or to the dungeon to die of starvation. Satan could not hinder the plan of salvation. Jesus was crucified and rose again the third day. He told his angels <clears throat> that he would make even the crucifixion and the resurrection to tell to his advantage. He was willing that those who professed faith in Jesus should believe that the laws regulating the Jewish sacrifices and offerings ceased at the death of Christ, if he could push them further and make them believe that the law of Ten Commandments died also with Christ. I saw that many readily yielded to this device of Satan. All heaven was moved with indignation as they saw the holy law of God trampled underfoot. Jesus and all the heavenly hosts were acquainted with the nature of God's law. They knew that he would not change or abolish it. The hopeless condition of man caused the deepest sorrow in heaven and moved Jesus to offer to die for the transgressions of God's holy law. If his law could be abolished, man might have been saved without the death of Jesus. The death of Christ did not destroy the law of his father, but magnified and honored it and enforces obedience to all its holy precepts. Had the church remained pure and steadfast, Satan could not have deceived them and led them to trample on the law of God. In, his bold, in this bold plan, Satan strikes directly at the foundation of God's government in heaven and on earth. His rebellion caused him to be expelled from heaven. After he rebelled in order to save himself, he wished God to change his law. But God told Satan before the whole heavenly host that his law was unalterable. Satan knows that if he can cause others to violate God's law, he is sure of them. For every transgressor of his law must die. Satan decided to go still further. He told his angels that some would be so jealous of God's law that they could not be caught in this snare. That the Ten Commandments were so plain that many would believe that they were still binding Therefore, he must seek to corrupt the fourth commandment, which brings to view the living God. <clears throat> he led on his representatives to attempt to change the Sabbath. 
and alter the only commandment of the ten, which brings to view the true God, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Satan presented before them the glorious resurrection of Jesus and told them that by his rising on the first day of the week, he changed the Sabbath from the seventh to the first day of the week. Thus Satan used the resurrection to serve his purpose. He and his angels rejoiced that the errors they had prepared to look took so well with the professed friends of Christ. When one might look upon with religious horror, another would receive. The different errors would be received and with zeal defended. The will of God plainly revealed in his word was covered up with the error and tradition which have been taught as the commandments of God. But although this heaven-daring deception was to be suffered to be carried on down through time until the second appearing of Jesus, yet through all this time of error and deception, God has not been left without a witness. There have been true and faithful witnesses keeping all of God's commandments through the darkness and persecution of the church. Now, <clears throat> shifting now back to the paper that we have been addressing the last couple of weeks, using crudence, going through different portions here. We have been dealing with three days, and last week, the conversation that we were having led us to a question about the third day. So we're going to scroll through some things. I did find that there was an error in my presentation on the three days. I have that now before you. Joshua, three, one to three. And Joshua rose early in the morning and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host and they commanded the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of, your, of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Now, in this situation with, with Joshua, is this again another representation of the children of Israel looking to enter into a covenant with God? I would say so. Okay. Anyone else? Well, they couldn't cross the Jordan. Right. So. Are we not looking to cross the heavenly Jordan at this time? Mm -hmm. Is this not our goal? Is this not what we are being led for? Mm -hmm. Everything. With the Levites. Okay. Now, as we continue through here, like I said, I'm going to be scrolling. A lot of this we covered over the last couple of weeks. <coughs> we covered the 40 days. Now, we come to the third day. And our first mention of the third day is the evening and the morning were the third day in Genesis 1.13. Right? Mm -hmm. So what is special about this? What is special about this mention of the third day? Well, it's the first mention. Okay. Now, 
I'm going to ask a question, Theodore, for your for your direct input. What is this word third in the Hebrew? Okay. Um, let me see here. Well, Shalishi, I mean, it means um, uh, the third of something. It can mean lots of different things, three years old. Is this not a word that's being expressed in the feminine gender? Yeah, yeah, it's the feminine form. So is this not something that is important for the church today? Here, just, uh, I'm just going to look at the Hebrew itself. Um, Okay, well, okay, so you're saying because it's in the feminine form that it should have something to do with the church. I'm asking the question, yes. Now, it's actually in the masculine singular form, though in the Hebrew. Then why do they show this in Strong's as being in the feminine? I don't know. Because, well, Strong's isn't looking at the actual form of that word. It's generally a feminine word. Because when I looked at it, it didn't look like it was feminine in the Hebrew. And it's not. It's masculine. So... So Strong's is just taking this word. Generally, it's it's a feminine. It, it Oh, when it's a third part of something, it's in the feminine form. Right. But this isn't talking about it as being the third part of something. It's talking about it being ordinal, which is different. But is this, I mean, is this not the third part of the week? No. Okay. Third part of the week is the third day of the week. So it's not a part of something. So when like uh, a third of the angels fell, that would be in the feminine form, just because it means when it's in the fem feminine form, it's then a third part. That's what it means. That's what Strong's is, is indicating. Okay. <clears throat> the next verse. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. In Genesis 22, what's being addressed here? Is this not the sacrifice of Isaac? Yeah, that's the sacrifice of Isaac, Genesis 22. Yeah. The following verse, Genesis 31, and it was told Laban on the third day that, jo that Jacob had fled. <clears throat> now, Part of our conversation had to do with this on the third day when we get down to this in Exodus. Yeah. We're being given many examples of the third day that have something to do with different events in the patriarch's life. Genesis 34, 25. And it came to pass on the third day, when they were sore, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. This was not according to God's order.
Now we come down to Genesis 40. And it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, which he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. Following later, Genesis 42, 18. And Joseph said to them on the third day, this do and live, for I fear God. Now, is this not the time where Joseph is letting his brothers out of prison? Like the third day is a time of action, some type of action or right. you know, event or something. Happening. So we're seeing different portions <laughs> with the third day being important in the lives of these patriarchs. That they have an action to perform. Bless you. Now, Exodus 4.10 was interesting to me. Because when I read this in the marginal reading, it does not seem to directly give the same reference that we're seeing here. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and a slow tongue. But if we take a look at the alternate reading, we have the following. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not a man of words, neither since yesterday, nor since the third day, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of a slow tongue. Now, why would the alternate reading give reference to the third day here with the burning bush. You don't even see, I don't even see a hint of it in, in the other reading, the original right. reading. Exactly. Is Moses not entering into a covenant to do the word of the Lord in front of the burning bush? Yep. Yep. So it gives us something further to look at. Now in Joshua 3, yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way heretofore. What's being referenced here? Is this not the crossing of the Jordan? Mm -hmm. It looks like it, yeah. So we go back again. We're going to look at the alternate reading. Well, it's going to say the same thing. Almost. Yeah. <clears throat> Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way since yesterday and the third day. So in these two selections, the word heretofore is being used in the alternate reading to give reference to the third day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the reason, the reason why it's doing that is the expression is, you, you know, today, tomorrow, and the third day. So if you're going to talk about today, yesterday, and the day before, that's going to be the third day. And that's the Hebrew expression. Okay. So King James translators don't translate it that way generally. They translate it as, as heretofore. 
or the day before, but, but it means the day before yesterday, which is the third day, making, making that day the third day. But it's sort of backwards, so that's why they do it that way. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Now we come to Exodus 1911 and 1915. Could somebody read those two verses, please? And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And he said unto the people, be ready against the third day, come not at your wives. Okay. I found it very interesting because... The conversation that you and I had last week, Theodore, yeah. had to do with coming against. Remember that? Yeah. Be ready against the third day. Right. Now, I was intrigued because neither Strong's nor Cruden's has that particular word against being translated in that way in these verses. Mm-hmm. Now, the alternate, and here I'm going to be looking at using an interlineal mm-hmm. Hebrew version. And be ready by the day third, for on the day third, will come down the Lord in the sight of all the people on Mount Sinai. And he said unto the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go into a woman. So my question regarding Exodus 1911, do we not see a doubling here? Yes. So is Exodus 19.11 a type of the second angel's message? Yeah, Uh, the midnight cry. Now, so the reason why, so I'm just trying to give you an explanation here. Sure. So, um, So when you look at this, uh, the Hebrew, um, so, because it says to be ready, that's the word um, uh, Nikonium, to be firm, to be stable, to be established. Um, and then it says to the day. So you're not going to have the word against there in Hebrew as a separate word it's it's actually the letter the lamid the l sound okay uh, it has the word yom which is day and then it has a lamid in front of it a l the yom and that's where you get the word against it's not a separate hebrew word um so it, it's saying to be prepared to the day or against the day the third day or the third right it's just the way that the uh, the Hebrew is. You have to translate it into English some way. So that's why I pointed out the word uh, against. So even though it's not a separate word. Now, you do have the doubling, right? So it's going to say against the third day um, uh, because um, in the third day. So there when you see the third the day the next time it doesn't have a lamid in front of it it has a bet which means in so you're going to be ready against the third day and because because in the third day so that's why it it um it has that word against and and also there is a doubling there so you're going to be ready against the third day because in the third day um the lord's going to come down Right? Does that make sense? 
The whole point of the study is to be able to make sense of these. Okay. Now, the point that I found interesting is the only reference in the spirit of prophecy of come not against was that in the story of Josiah. Okay. So, um, and that was, what was the, that was second Chronicles. They're giving reference of this from second Chronicles, but this was, I believe, manuscript 163. Well, where is the statement in second Chronicles? Um, um, take a look at second Chronicles. I believe it's 2420. I don't think that's right. Uh, let me find it. No. Thirty four. Thirty four twenty. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's 20, but it should be there. Um, no, it can't be there. 35. Josiah killed in battle. Okay. Um, Joshua, Josiah went out against him. I just wanted, so. So here there's a completely different idea. I mean, because this here against is not leaning up against. This is actually in conflict with. Um, right. Encounter, a hostile encounter. Where the one where it talks about against the third day is. Uh, just a completely different type of expression. We use the same English word, but it doesn't mean to come out against uh, the third day in a hostile way. Okay. Okay. So we'll continue. Right. Leviticus 7, 16 and 17. But if the sacrifice of his offering be a vow or a voluntary offering, it shall be eaten the same day that he offereth his sacrifice. And on the morrow also the remainder of it shall be eaten. But the remainder of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burnt with fire. <clears throat> so this offering, this vow, was to be burned <clears throat> completely on the third day. Okay. Leviticus 19.5 And if ye offer a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, ye shall offer it at your own will. It shall be eaten on the same day ye offer it. And on the morrow, and if aught remain on the third day, it shall be burnt with fire. So here we have a repetition, right? Uh -huh. So would we say that God is very particular about this as far as the peace offerings and the vows and the voluntary offerings? Uh -huh. Now we come to Numbers 19, 11, and 12. He that touches the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself with it on the third day. And on the seventh day, he shall be clean. But if he purify it, not himself on the third day, then the seventh day, he shall not be clean. Now, what's important about this? Well, 
Well, it has the seven days connected to it. So if somebody touches a dead body, which is going to be the red heifer offering that's going to use to purify himself. So this is a, um, uh, what's the word? It's an offering that's set aside because you have the ashes of this red heifer that's going to be used to, if you touch a dead body. So you're going to be unclean seven days, but in order to be clean, you would have to be purified on the third day. Otherwise, you're not going to be clean on the seventh day. Right. Let's find the third and the seventh together. Does this also not have some kind of import for the second Passover? Um, well, the, the issue there would be, let's say someone is, uh, he's, he had, you know, his family member died and the Passover is coming. Uh, so he couldn't be clean in time for the Passover. So then you would have to wait until the second Passover to participate. Uh, so in that way, it would have an application to the second Passover. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. So we hear what we're seeing here is that those that touch a dead body are to be unclean seven days, but he's, they are to purify themselves on the third day. And on the seventh day, he will be clean if he purifies himself on the third day. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Now, Numbers 31.19 compared with Numbers 19.19. And do ye abide without the camp seven days? Whosoever hath killed any person, and whosoever hath touched any slain, purify both yourselves and your captives on the third day, and on the seventh day. And the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day, and on the seventh day, and on the seventh day he shall purify himself and wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be clean at even. So we, we return to this about the washing of the clothes. We return to this about the third day. And then we have this tie in again with the seventh day. And on the third day, 11 bullocks, two rams, 14 lambs of the first year without blemish. This is a specific offering. It's interesting to me when I, when I went through this to see just how many animals in this time frame, at this point, were to be sacrificed. Deuteronomy 19.4. <clears throat> And this is the case of the slayer, which shall flee thither, that he may live, whosoever killeth his neighbor ignorantly, whom he hated not in time past. And the marginal reading gives us, and this is the case of the slayer, which shall flee thither, that he may live, whoso killeth his neighbor ignorantly, whom he hated not from yesterday the third day. Here again, the verse in the King James does not give any reference to the third day, but the alternate reading does. Yeah, hated not from yesterday or heretofore, right? It is right. That. Yeah, so again, and, and see, this is kind of my point about this, this third day, which I know probably isn't necessarily your point. But, you know, Jesus Christ is resurrected the third day. Right. He says that himself, um, that he would be resurrected the third day. He also says after three days. Right. And this expression, when we looked at the th three days, because that was what your study was on originally, we can see that three days as an inclusive reckoning is the same as the third day in ordinal reckoning. Okay. And even when you talk about three days and three nights, it's not a 72-hour period. Just like oh. when Esther fasts for three days, night and day, 
And on the third day, she comes before Xerxes. Um, so this expression, in, in Hebrew especially, it's, it's used again and again. I mean, it, it, there's probably no more, it, it, there's way more references to the third day than the seventh day or the fourth day or the second day or any other kind of day. Especially when you look at and, and you add in this heretofore, which is also the third day. Um, now it's the third day in the past because it's talked, that's why the King James prefers to translate it as heretofore. Um, but they could have said from yesterday and the day before that. Um, but, but the point is, Jesus uses this expression. He talks about uh, talking to Herod, um, you know, calling him a fox and saying today, uh, yesterday, what is, what's the expression? Today, tomorrow, and the third day. So, so this expression, the third day, has this symbolic um, import, and it has to do with the covenant. Because Christ is going to be resurrected the third day. Right. And it shows up again and again. But see, that's that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make right now is that the third day is related to the covenant. Mm. Okay, could somebody read Deuteronomy 19.6? Lest, <clears throat> sorry, lest the avenger of the blood pursue the slayer while his heart is hot and overtake him because the way is long and slay him whereas he was not worthy of death inasmuch as he hated him not in the past. Okay, now when we look at this with the marginal reading, We see lest the avenger of the blood pursue the slayer while his heart is hot and overtake him because the way is long and slay him. Whereas he was not worthy of death inasmuch as he hated him not from yesterday, the third day. Yeah. yeah so it's an interesting expression. Um, you know, you know, symbolically, I mean, this idea that you're talking about somebody that you kill accidentally and, and it's going to say he didn't hate him yesterday or the day before that. But it's it's really third day. Right. It, that's it's very interesting that you picked up on this. <clears throat> now, as we continue, we have. Joshua 19, or 9, 6, 16, and 17. And it came to pass at the end of three days, after they had made a league with them, that they heard that they were their neighbors, and that they dwelt among them. And the children of Israel journeyed, and came unto their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, and Shephriah, and Beeroth, and Kurjath Jerem. So here are the people that pretended to be from afar off. The children of Israel were told not to make a league with the nations around them, and that's exactly what they did here. And it's on the third day that they discover the falsehood. What does this mean for us today? As I look at this, are we to enter into covenant with the Protestants around us? <clears throat> no. no. Okay. Now, we're going to come down to Joshua 20, verse 30. And the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day. 
and put themselves in array against Gibeah, as at other times. Why did they wait to go up against the children of Israel? Why, why did they wait to go up against the children of Benjamin on the third day? Other than to be some kind of symbolic um, uh, design based upon God's uh, uh, providence. Right. Or, I mean, I just have to read more of the context of this. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's, we'll continue on. It just, th this was something that I'm having to consider. Because this verse, of course, the, the war against the children of Benjamin is one of those in the Bible that has presented some strange images. Yeah. Well, what are the things in this story in Judges? You also have the mention from Dan even to Beersheba. Right. Which Jeff has made, uh, you know, emphasis on. Um. So they're going to go against the children of ben Benjamin. Um, and what's and it has something to do with the ark. I'm just trying to see the context of this. What was this about? Why did they go into war? I don't remember this. Okay. This was dealing with the the that uh, the Levite and the concubine. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, it's one of those. Stories you never do a sermon on in church. Uh, right. So then you're going to have. Okay. But, uh, do you want to give us context on this just to understand it? Okay. Or so you... when we look at, at Judges 20. Yeah. The children of Israel were gathered together as one man from Dan even to Beersheba, to Beersheba mm -hmm. with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mizpeh. And the chief of all the people, even the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew the sword. <clears throat> so we have the situation here where they have the... Levite with a concubine uh -huh. and he allows the concubine to be slain uh -huh. and pieces of the concubine are sent out to all of the different tribes uh -huh. and the rest of the tribes found this to be very offensive uh -huh. the question is why did they find it offensive so it's something for us to consider. It's something to to look at. Because this is an important story, even though it's it's kind of grotesque in a lot of ways. Right. Um, and yeah, I would have to spend more time on this to understand it. Okay. But it's linked in here with the third day. Right. Well, now it also easier. mentioned, yeah, and 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 it's also because um, they're going to come against them on the second day, and then also on the third day. Right. It mentions, and the children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin on the second day. So I guess they don't come against them. So on the second day, they're going to come near them, and then on the third day, they're going to come out against them. That's kind of interesting. That's good. Anyway, uh, it's one of those stories we need to look into more. Okay. Now we're going to go into 1 Samuel, chapter 4, 5, 6, and 7. Would someone like to read this, please?
And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted and with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the Ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Now the alternate reading. Of course, we're keying here with this heretofore. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing yesterday or the third day. Now, as we're aware, this story in, in 1 Samuel is where Hophni and Phinehas have taken the ark when they were not bidden to take it. Hophni and Phinehas meet their demise. And so does their father, Eli. And then Samuel becomes the priest and the judge for Israel. 1 Samuel 19.7 And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul... And he was in his presence as in times past. But the alternate reading says, And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all these things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as yesterday, third day. It's intriguing to me. Uh that the translators would see this referencing the third day, but would choose words that obscure the third day. Well, I mean, I, it's understandable because we wouldn't use that expression in English. That is, we wouldn't say yesterday and the third day to refer to the past, right? Okay. So, so I understand why they translated the way they did. All right. But it, it is interesting. Okay. That they use expression to refer to the past. Right. It, 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 that is, this third day becomes this sort of inclusive time in the past. You don't have to refer to it like 100 days ago. You just need to refer to the third day ago to include all the time before it. Right. <laughs> so, but that would also apply to the future. Agreed. But what does, what does this with the third day mean for us today? Well, I mean, it's the sign of Jonah. Jonah, I mean, Christ being resurrected on the third day. I mean, if if you can use it in the past to refer to the past sort of eternally, you can use it to refer to the future eternally as well. Right. This covenant of the three days and the third day, to the Hebrew mind, it's symbolic of something eternal, whether in the past or the future. And we just never noticed this before. Okay. So, the, so having the covenant being on the third day, today, tomorrow, on the third day, the significance is not just the counting of days, but it's what the third day symbolizes. It's kind of this eternal completeness. Right. In relation to time. Could we, could we also look mm -hmm. at this, that the third day is, since we're saying this is eternal completeness, is also representative of the Holy Spirit. I could see that. 
Yeah, I could see that too. Yeah. No. It would explain some of things too. I mean, all these thirds that are talked about, you know, a third of the angels fell and all, all these different thirds, things being divided into thirds, third days in the future, third days in the present, third days in the past. All these things become then much more significant as a symbol. So it brings up the symbol much more clearly than it has before. Okay, so now the next question that I'm gonna I'm gonna present is this with the third day also representational of the third angel's message? I think it would have to be. I don't think you could you could say that it can't be. I don't see it not be. I mean, this this gives us a a firmer platform because if the third day in all of these examples in the Old Testament are being seen as related to a covenant, then how difficult is it that the third angel's message is God seeking to enter into a covenant with his last day people? Wow. <clears throat> Okay, 2 Samuel 3.17. And Abner had communication with the elders of Israel, saying, You sought for David in times past to be king over you. And here again, And Abner had communication with the elders of Israel, saying, You sought for David both yesterday and the third day to be king over you. Is Abner not seeing the situation with David as being a covenant relationship. And can we not apply this as being related to the third angel's message? So now we have a couple of verses that back each other up. 1 Kings 12, 12, and 2 Chronicles 10, 12. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And 2 Chronicles, so Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king bade, saying, Come again to me on the third day. Two examples of the same of, of the same story. Wow. Okay, Second Kings thirteen five, <clears throat> and the Lord gave Israel a savior, so that they went out from under the hand of the Syrians, and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before time. Here again, before time, in the alternate reading is presented as yesterday and third day. The more I went through this, the more I looked at this, the more clear it was for me that the third day was a time of covenant. And I had to give the thought whether this covenant also was relating to the third angel's message. We've talked in the past that the first angel's message, fear God, the second, give glory to him, are important because when we get to the third angel's message, for the hour of his judgment has come, is something we need to be carefully considering. So, in all of these examples, we're being shown that the third day is important 
for our understanding. Second Kings 20, verse 5. Can I ask a question? Please go ahead. <clears throat> um, I know this is probably going to sound like a stupid question, but I want to ask it anyway. The, the alternate reading, where does it come from? I'm using the 1769 Oxford Revised King James. This is what the translators of the King James Bible placed into the margins of the King James Bible. And when the 1769 Bible was being published, they wished to amend any of the spelling errors, any of the grammatical errors, but keep to the original context of the 1611 King James Bible. You said 1769, right? That's exactly what I said. Okay. So if we, if we use 1769 and we were to subtract from that 1611, what would we have? Just as a strange thought. One fifty eight. Does one fifty eight have any kind of import for us in this movement right now? Well, that would be um, August fifteenth. It's on the 1843 chart, the time of the league between the Jews and Romans. Was 158. Oh, yeah. That. Take a look right in the middle of the 1843 chart. Yeah. Yeah. 150 is there, yeah. You said that Bible is Oxford? Yes. Cambridge. Oxford. It's Oxford. Okay. Now, using what, what was interesting to me is that I went through this and I used my Cruden's Concordance. What had confused me was some of the footnoting that was used in Cruden's with all of these verses. Once I came to an understanding of what the, the footnote symbols meant, this opened up this entire study. It sure, it sure has opened it up. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Second Kings 20 verse 5 and 20 verse 8. Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of the right people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father. I've heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Therefore, I will heal thee. On the third day, thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, what shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day? So here we have Hezekiah the king and Isaiah, a major prophet. <clears throat> First Chronicles 11.2. And moreover in time past, when Saul was king, thou wast he that ledest out and broughtest in Israel. And the Lord thy God said unto thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be ruler over my people Israel. But again, the margin reading says, and moreover, both yesterday and the third day, even when Saul was king, 
Thou wast he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord thy God said unto thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be ruler over my people Israel. So is the phrase, my people Israel, as presented here, another doubling that has to do with the third day? It looks like it, yeah. So does this have something to do with the second angel's message? Uh -huh. Okay. Ezra 6, 14 and 15. And the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. And they builded and finished it according to the command of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. <coughs> and this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius, the king. What do we take from this passage? What is the third day of the month of Adar? Well, it's the third day of the 12th month. Okay. Now, now it happens to be March uh, uh, 12th in uh, 515 BC. Okay. So it's the first date that I ever noticed that if you took the biblical date and you inverted the day in the month, you would get the, the Julian date. Really? Yeah, because it's it's the twelfth day of the third month, March twelfth, but it's also the third day of the twelfth month on the day. Okay. So yeah, so I noticed that back in two thousand and fourteen, and and that was one of the keys that allowed me to see some of the one is that it was an important date because it's, it's the date in which Samuel Snow's first letter is published. Uh, which in that, that year, in 1844, is February 22nd. But it's the third day of the 12th month on the biblical calendar. Okay. Um, now, there's another thing, too, about these numbers. So it's the sixth year of Darius. Right. The third day of the 12th month. And if you multiply them, because uh, 3 times 12 is 36, and 6 times 36 is 216. 216 is the number you get when you multiply 6 times 6 times 6. Um, and this number shows up again and again. Uh, and, and this relates to the fact that Ezekiel's prophecy, which is connected to this, which I'm not going to go into in all the details, but Ezekiel's prophecy counts 666 years from the captivity of Jehoiachin to the destruction of uh, this temple. That is, the temple that's finished here, the second temple, is going to be destroyed uh, 666 years after the captivity of Jehoiachin. Which is also connected to 36 years because Jehoiachin is in captivity for 36 years, plus the 70 weeks ends 36 years before the destruction of the temple. So the 70 weeks end in 34 AD, it's 36 years. So, so there's significance in this date in that way. But it's also, just from what your study is, this third day, um, this is the covenant that's being made. And they're going to uh, have a Passover 40 days later. So there's quite a bit to deal with on this third day. Mm. Okay, now we come to the book of Esther. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel 
and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. Here again, the phrase over against is repeated twice. Why? Well, it's the second angel's message. Right. <clears throat> now we come to Hosea 6, 1 to 6, 3. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will rise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter in the former rain upon the earth. Hosea is telling us in the third day, he will raise us up. Are we in a, a time period now where we are beginning to live in the third day? Well, since December 25th. Right. Yeah, there's a bunch of people who are suggesting that December 25th was a close of probation, which, of course, it can't be, because you can't have a call to repentance. If we're now being called to repentance, uh, we couldn't be called to repentance if our probation is closed. Right. So the significance of December 25th and all of our lines has been about an increase of light. And it's been bringing us to a point where we have to go back and re-examine uh, the old paths in a way that we've never done before. Right. That is specifically, if you want to look at it, Jeff began a work of going back to the old paths. <laughs> and, Bless you. And, and God has been directing this movement to go back. And we keep thinking that we've gone back far enough and that we've corrected and, and understood the past, but we haven't. But other things keep popping up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now, as, we, as we're coming down to this, from the time, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go up to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and raised again the third day. <clears throat> now, as we look at this, is Christ not entering into a covenant, offering a covenant with his disciples when he's raised again the third day? Uh -huh. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be slain, and be raised the third day. So, elders, chief priests, and the scribes, is that not a threefold union? And here is Christ to be raised on the third day? And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, 
And the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Is this not again a threefold union being shown against Christ? What do you think? Well, the chief priests, scribes, and, and the Gentiles, is that what you're saying? Yeah. The Romans? Yeah. Mark 9, 31. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, that they shall kill him. And after that, he is killed. He shall rise the third day. Mark 10, 32 to 34. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus went before them. And they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes. And they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him and they shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. <clears throat> Luke eighteen thirty one to 34. And he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And all things that were written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be marked, spitefully entreated, and spitted upon. And they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things that were spoken. Are we not in the same situation today that we have not fully understood the import of the third day. Here the disciples are being prepared. Are we not today being prepared to be able to give a message that the prophets themselves had looked to give? Now, Luke 24, 6, and 7, and 8. He is not here, but he is written. He is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus is it, it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Are not repentance and remission of sins the equivalent of, of fear God and give message? What do you see? I would agree. Okay. Anyone else? You have problems with this? No. 
Okay? No. Okay, now we jump back to Matthew 27. And the next day that followed the day of preparation. What day follows the day of preparation? Sabbath? Yes. The chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remembered that the deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way. Make it as sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure sealing the stone, and setting a watch. So they, in this Passover, they were so willing to see to it that the grave was secure. They were willing to set aside the Passover to try to make their point with the people. Is this not men following the dictates of their own will rather than that of God? Yeah, definitely. Luke 13, 31 to 33. <clears throat> Someone like to read that, please? And the same day there came certain of the Pharisees, saying unto him, Get thee out, and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go ye, and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. What are we seeing here? It says we'll walk day and tomorrow and the day following. Looks, looks very familiar. Yeah. And the third day or and the third I shall be perfected does this there's not, a promise right. sorry right there's a but, promise there that the lord will always have a prophet among his people or at least someone who's speaking the truth who dares to stand up against the general apostasy okay but is this also not showing us the messages of Revelation 14. Because on the third day, the judgment of God, are not his people perfected in his sight? Yeah. It goes along with Hosea uh, verse 1, 2, and 3. Hosea 6. Verse 1, 2, and 3. Okay. Which we already read. But. Right. Hosea 6. And one of them, whose name was Clophus, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, what things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have him crucified. 
that we have trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yeah, I mean, this verse, uh, I know this is your topic, but when it comes to the Wednesday crucifixion people and they want to have Jesus in the grave for 72 hours. Right. And we have the disciples on the road to Emmaus and they they meet Jesus. They don't say this is the fourth day or the fifth day since these things have happened because they're not talking. They're talking about when he's delivered to the chief priests and condemned and crucified. And they say this is the third day. So it's very strong evidence that it's actually the third day. <laughs> not uh, in a Wednesday crucifixion. There's no way you could say um, that it's the the third day if he was crucified on a Wednesday. Right. So this is giving, as, as we have observed, this is giving testimony that this was occurring on the third day since the crucifixion. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and as we have accepted, the day of the crucifixion was the preparation day. Christ remained in the grave on the Sabbath. Yeah. Here is the third day from the crucifixion. Yeah. And, and we've been, and the Bible has kept defining for us what the third day is. Right. Normally what we'd call two days later, but the Bible will call it three days. It'll call it after three days. It'll even call it three days and three nights, but it's also the third day. Right. Um, I just want to go back to this Hoshea one. Sure. There's, I mean, this call in Hoshea, come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. And after two days will he revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. And it says, then shall we know if we follow on to the know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, and as the latter rain and former rain upon the earth. And so the idea there is if we're going to receive the latter rain, we have to go through this experience, which is the three angels' messages. We have we are given both the latter and the former rain in the same month, which is another verse. Okay. But does this also in relation to what we, we have been looking at with the disciples in the upper room show us that this from Hosea is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit when a people are prepared to enter into covenant with the Lord? Yeah, and there's there's all the symbols there. I mean, Jesus rests in the tomb on the seventh day. He's resurrected the third day. There's 40 days that he's with them. And then there's going to be Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out, which is a symbol of the latter rain, even though, in a sense, we call it the former rain. Um, so all of these things are tied together to what this movement has experienced. Okay. Now, there was a comment in the chat that I found kind of interesting. Luke 13.32. And additively, if we take that the chapter and the verse together, we come to 45. And 13.33, additively, we come to 46. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. So the comment in the chat was, and Christ called Herod a fox 
and compared Jerusalem and his people to chickens. The fox in the hen house. Yep. So it was a nice, a, a nice catch on that one. John 2, 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. The third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Marriage being one of the covenant relationships established in Eden. And Christ is showing his desire to be among men and that he is willing to celebrate this, this marriage, this wedding. He's not setting aside the marriage. <clears throat> he is there to participate. Acts 27, 19. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Why is this important for us to see at this point? I mean, without the tackling, they wouldn't be able to, to moor the ship, right? Uh-huh. So the ship would be adrift. It would be at the mercy of the waves. Yet on the third day, they cast out with their own hands the tackling of the ship. Now we come to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Paul recognized the importance of the third day. Could we look at this <clears throat> Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, giving a direct example of Revelation 14? I think we've established this. Now, we come to a verse, a single verse. It's the only time that we're going to find this in Scripture. It's Nehemiah 6.15. So the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month, Elul, in 50 and 2 days. <clears throat> Here again. If the wall is finished in 52 days, we have a period of three days and another period of 49 days. 49 being seven times seven. So is 52 <clears throat> in this situation not a numerical representation of the covenant? What do you think? Yeah, and what does the wall symbolize? Is that not a hedge? Yeah, like the law is the is and and you have in your chronology uh, 52 days as well. Right. With the law being given. Yeah. 
though Stephen was trying to count it a little bit differently, but I still think symbolically it's 52 days. Right. But as we go through this, in the chronology that we have addressed before, we can look at the Millerites from the time that the Pope was taken captive to the selection of a new Pope, we have three years. It took 49 years for the Millerites that remained faithful <coughs> to understand the importance of the Sabbath. And it's interesting to me that three years before they, un they understood the importance of the Sabbath, that James and Ellen White were married. So we have 52 in the time of the Millerites, because on that 52nd year, do we not have the 1850 chart? Mm -hmm. And as, as we said this last week, is this not a symbol of God looking to come into covenant with his people? Mm -hmm. Yet within six years, we find those within the church had entered into a Laodicean condition. 13 years, and we find that they have set aside the understandings of the Millerite time frame and set aside the two tables, Habakkuk's two tables. Is not 13 a number of rebellion? Uh -huh. So as we go through this, by 1863, can we not see that not only is the church Laodicean, but they are in full-blown rebellion from what God would have them to understand? So here, here we have these 52 days. We see this occurring in Nehemiah. We see this occurring in the Millerite time frame. We see it occurring in Christ's last week. <clears throat> and we can see it in the time of the children of Israel as they came to Rephidim. Does the verse not state that on the testimony of two or three shall a thing be established? Uh -huh. So how many, how many representations do we have here? Is it not four? Uh -huh. So what is God saying to us today? Are we willing to listen to what he is saying or are we going to walk according to our own paths? What say you today? All right. If there's no further comments, shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we are seeing our great need of you. We cannot afford to set aside even the smallest of your admonitions to us today. Help us now, Father. Please guide us. Be with us <clears throat> so that we may walk in the path that you would set before us. Direct us where you would have us to be. 
so that your will is done in our lives, even in the smallest details. Guide us so that we do not work and walk according to the fires of our own kindling. Help us to walk according to the light that you are giving us. Please direct us now. Please guide us. Show us that that you would have us to do on this Sabbath and in the days to come. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.